Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Parsons Technical Webinar Series. I'm your host, Jessica B Bennett, and today we have Les Cordon with us presenting on lessons learned in applying PFAS absorption technologies to surface water and groundwater. Next slide, please. A few housekeeping items up front. We'll keep everyone muted during the presentation to keep background noise down. And then towards the end of the Q&A session, we'll uh, change the settings so people can ask questions live if you'd like to. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can enter them at any time in the chat feature uh, and we'll ask them at the end, uh, or you can wait until the end and ask them your live or by submitting the chat feature. This webinar has been approved for one PDH credit if you'd like to receive a PDA certificate, you can download the uh, attendance form and there are four multiple choice questions in there that you will need to answer. So please take a look at those first. We'll post a link to this uh, form with the questions in it in the chat uh, several times throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have any issues getting to that link or getting the PDH form, you can just send us an email and we'll get that to you. Uh, and also this webinar will be posted online on YouTube and uh, you can go back there and reference it if you have any further questions or for the PDH credit. Uh, next slide, please. So a brief agenda, I'll introduce our guest speaker, Les Cordon. Uh, he'll start out with a core value moment, followed by the technical presentation, and then we'll wrap up at the end with a Q&A session. So Les Cordon is a vice president and manager of Parsons Industrial Waste and Wastewater Treatment Practice. He has over 37 years of water treatment experience, including over 15 years of experience in the design, construction, and operation of treatment systems for the removal of PFAS compounds. He specializes in industrial wastewater, groundwater, and leachate treatment systems around the world. And he's also a PE registered in the state of New York. And with that, I'll turn it over to Les for the core value moment. OK, thanks everyone for joining. We have a nice discussion on the wild world of aqueous phase PFAS treatment. Um, first thing I want to do is go through a core value moment. These are our Parsons core values. Today, I picked one on sustainability. And uh, I want to talk a little bit. I used this one in a, in a presentation that I did with a G Nambiar back in 20. 22, and you might want to look that one up because it's it's about water reuse and it's a very both on the municipal and industrial side, the state of the art where we're at in water reuse. Um, this is a map. This is a global map that shows highlighted areas where uh, various regions are in a water deficit and a water deficit means you know, like a high or extremely high water deficit means that your your annual usage of water is a high percentage of the available water that the water, the, the renewable water resource that's available to you is you're at a high percentage of that. And you can see, you know, as suspected in the in the Mideast, which is a very arid region and th those areas of the, of the world, you know, they, they are basically at a at a. Uh, uh, a high water uh, uh, stress area, but I want to draw your attention to Western United States. Uh, area including uh southern california and our western states including areas within texas colorado etc um, we're at high or extremely high uh water deficit areas uh, uh situation right now and we have been for a number of years um, even though in southern california right now there's a huge amount of of uh, snow melt coming off of the sierras uh we are at a we are at a water deficit there, and it's a long term issue. And sustainability and water use is something that's being practiced in 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 those areas. It's been going on for over ten years. There's a number of projects that have been done where uh, municipal wastewater that's treated is being treated to really beyond drinking water quality, and then being. Uh, uh, directed to aquifers where later it's pumped up and then treated again for drinking water. Uh, use in Southern California. That's also happening in some other states now, including Texas. Um, and it's it's going it, to it it's something that's going to continue to happen. And 
and, and because because of the, the water supply is is in is is short right now and it's going to it's going to be that way going forward so if you want to know more information about that whole uh you know what what's happening in that world and the technologies that are allowing that to happen just check in our you know on our webinars there and you'll see one uh, by myself and ajish that we did last year so okay i'm going to move on to this presentation okay this is not an introductory presentation on pfas this is not about the regulatory framework this is about how to, if, if you're going to treat for PFOS right now, you're probably going to use an adsorption technology, be that activated carbon or ion exchange, uh, and you can treat it to very low levels. Likely you'll be able to, uh, but there's some things that you need to understand about how to optimize that system, and you can optimize the system, uh, especially if you have uh, high concentrations of PFOS that you need to treat, say in the microgram per liter range or greater. Um, you can save a lot of money and still treat still treat to almost to non-detect levels basically at the current uh, detection limits uh, but you have to make decisions along the way and you have to do a little bit of work that's really what this presentation is about i want you to uh, walk away from this with an understanding of the questions that you need to under that you need to ask and how you and how you need to look at data in order to make those decisions and a few things that we've learned from designing such systems doing a lot of pilot work and and treating treating these compounds over really the past 15 years. Okay, so typical, uh, uh, this is a, a typical list of, of the PFAS compounds and there's there's, carbox, there's carboxylic acid compounds, there's uh, sulfonic acid compounds, and uh, there's, there's uh, monoether branch compounds, et cetera, okay? There's a laundry list of these compounds. Right now, it's the 537 analytical method, but there's currently in development, it's not final yet, is a 1633 analytical method, which I believe is uh, really slated to be used for wastewater analysis. And uh, that's got 40 compounds in it that can be analyzed. As you, you probably know, if you know anything about PFAS, Everybody's talking about it all the time now. There's thousands and thousands of these compounds out there. Okay, the ones that are that are likely to be regulated and that are currently regulated right now at the state level. There's a number of states that have drinking water standards for several of the compounds. Things like PFOA, uh, 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 PFOS, uh, uh, dimer acid, which is Gen X, and a, and a couple other compounds are being regulated at the at the state level in various states. And then there's federal. Uh, federal uh, standards being developed right now uh, the, for the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, and they are, they are likely to be fairly restrictive for the more well-known PFAS compounds. And what we're looking at in terms of treatment just keeps getting uh, lower and lower treatment requirements. We're, you know, a basic assumption is that you're in the single to uh, single digit nanogram per liter range that you're going to have to treat these compounds to if you're in a situation where you're being regulated on them. OK, and and for that type of treatment, you're going to look at an, adsor an immediate solution. You're going to look at look at an adsorption technology, which would be something like GAC. There's also some engineered uh, uh, clay uh, uh, products out there or ion exchange. There's other technologies that you can use to treat PFAS uh, separation technologies like reverse osmosis uh, and and uh, heavy oxidation techniques like boron doped electrodes or uh, supercritical oxidation type type techni techniques, including incineration, basically. Okay. Let's just look at the compound briefly. So per and polyfluorinated, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compound on a carbon backbone and a perfluorinated one is completely saturated with fluorines. And a polyfluorinated one is not completely saturated, but they're they're pretty much still PFAS compounds. Okay, I'm showing you three different compounds here that are on a carb. They're they're carboxylic acid type PFAS compounds, and you can see the C double bond OH moiety that's sticking on these compounds. These three that I have on here. This is PFNA, perfluorononanoic acid, because it's got nine carbons in it with a carboxylic acid functional group. OK, and this one here is I refer to as dimer acid, but this is the Gen X compound. This is a branched monoether compound here with the oxygen. And this is a shorter chain branched monoether compound. 
So if I was to look at these compounds and, was, and somebody just asked me, hey, how would you treat these compounds? If I'm looking at this one, I'm going to say I'd use activated carbon because it looks like it's a long chain, high molecular weight. You know, the only thing that would cause me pause is I'd say, hey, what's the pKa of this of this carboxylic acid functional group? In other words, when is it ionized and when is it not ionized? At what pH? And the answer to this is typically these these pKa's are at a low pH, lower than you find you know in the natural environment. And so, in general, these are ionized. OK, the information is not known for all these compounds, but, you know, for, for the well-known ones, it's kind of known. And so when you see this compound in the environment, it's going to be in a negative one charge sort of or a portion of the compound is a high percentage of it is. So it is kind of an ionic compound. Same with these other two. All right. Uh, so if I was to look at, OK, well, this is a long chain, high molecular weight. It's a little bit polar, which is bad for sorption, but this this. This part here is, you know, the, is the tail that's going to wag the dog, and so I'd say, yeah, carbon would carbon adsorption would probably be good for this compound. You get to this compound, it's a little less clear, but I would still say carbon adsorption. When you get down to this compound here, this is a lower molecular weight carbon uh, compound. It's got three carbons on it. Um, it's going to be heavily influenced by this, you know by this carboxylic acid functional group. Now I'd say, hey, maybe ion exchange for this one would be preferable to, to activated carbon. Uh, let's let's see. That's kind of how I would look at this, all right? I think I just said everything that's on this page here. So if you have to treat these compounds in a, in a contaminated groundwater or surface water and you have reasonable levels of contamination, and I mentioned before, that means in the low microgram per liter range, maybe up to the hundreds of microgram per liter range. Uh, and you're going to be treating these compounds down to, like I said, like the single nanogram per liter kind of range uh, or in that range, basically non-detect. You really want to look at um, optimization of your treatment method. Like what, even within the sorption or ion exchange um, uh, categories, there are there are optimized treatment scenarios. Believe me, where a lot of O and M costs can be saved. You're going to treat these to non-detect, but you you can make decisions that'll allow you to save a significant amount of money when you're operating these systems. Depending on which sorbent you choose, how you how you uh, pipe your reactors together, what your reactors look like, um, and the answer is not the same. <laughs> It, every time okay that's one thing we've learned that's a hint that's like a question i think it's one of the questions the answer there is no one answer that gives you the best solution so no matter what any vendor tells you there is no one answer okay and i'm going to give you a bunch of slides that are going to show that to you basically i'm going to demonstrate it to you uh the photos here this is just some work going on our treatability lab this is a column study a very small column study technique that we would use um to check a, a a water matrix that we're treating for maybe different sorbents uh, in the uh, 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 you know in the columns. Uh, this is a treatment plant that we built around 15 years ago in Northern Jersey. It's a PFOA treatment system. This is something that you run into when you're treating groundwater. If you guys are you know if you guys have experience treating groundwater, is iron okay? And and it's it's a it's something that you really have to pay attention to. If you have iron in your water, I'm going to be talking about that pre-treatment challenges uh, before you go into a sorption column, or you can really negate the effect of the sorbents. There's just some photos of some carbon columns there. So I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to, I got six or seven or eight slides here showing you isotherm information. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is what this is. So this is an activated carbon isotherm that I'm showing you here. And what this is basically is an equilibrium plot, okay? And if you start with a, a sample that has a PFAS compound in it, sometimes you spike the sample, sometimes it's the just the background PFAS, you would set up a number of bottles here, each with a varying uh, concentration of sorbent media in it, okay? From no, from no media to uh, different doses of carbon, you run them in duplicate, you let them equilibrate, you analyze the decant, okay? And from that, you, if you're lucky, 
you'll get a plot that looks something like that's a continuous plot that looks something like this. OK, uh, and what this shows is the on this axis, it's the concentration in the water after you after it's equilibrated, referred to as the equilibrium concentration. And on this axis, it's the amount of contaminant, the target PFAS compound sorbed per mass of sorbent. So the higher this number is, the more efficiently the material sorbing on your on your media that you're paying money for. OK. Um, so that's that's what this is. And I'm going to I'm going to show you a ton of these that show different waters that are being treated, different levels of complexity in the background of the water. Uh, different sorbent material and just comparing them just to show you some things about what we see when we when we do this work and how there's really no one answer for optimization of which sorbent sorbent media works best. You know, it, it all it's all dependent on the situation and the background chemistry of the water that you're treating that has a lot of effect. OK. So. Here is the first one I'm going to show you. OK, so so again, remember, if the curves up here, it's really more efficiently sorbing onto the onto the adsorbent media. OK, so these are this is just to give you an idea of two different groundwaters. OK, purple ones on top, you got the second groundwater on the bottom. The first groundwater is has got a, has got PFAS in it, but it's a low background complexity. There's not a lot of other PFAS compounds in there. There's there's you know in general these this data, this information I'm showing you today is like low low organic background concentration, like total organic compound uh, co carbon concentrations in the like three to five milligram per liter range. This is not wastewater, this is groundwater and surface water. Okay. And this just shows you that for and uh, to the two matrices, this one is an, is a PFAS and a non-complex matrix. This is PFAS in uh, a, a groundwater that's more complex with more PFAS in it, different kinds of PFAS, more more highly contaminated, um, but the same concentration of the compound that we're targeting and we're showing here. So frankly, I don't even remember what compound it was. I think it's a C6 compound. Okay, C6 PFAS. What you see here is that in this case, we get more efficient adsorption in the low background complexity um, sample, okay? Which is what you would expect to see, but I'm just showing it to you to prove it's the same carbon, you're, you're treating the same compound, but it treats much more efficiently in this one because you have less comp competition for sorption sites. In this one, you got other PFAS compounds. They're they're also fighting for places on the adsorption uh, sor absorption sites of the. Uh, this is an activated carbon one. Okay, I would expect to see something similar if I did this with ion exchange resin also. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a couple things with comparing activated carbon with an engineered bentonite product that's out there that's also known and being advertised as good for treatment of PFAS, OK? Um, so let's look at this one. We got the engineered bentonite is the purple line, all right? And the granular activated carbon in this case is the green line. We're using, this is a Calgon product, filter sorb 400, F400. That's kind of the go-to right now for treating PFAS in terms of if you're going to use activated carbon, you would definitely look at that carbon uh, along with some other ones, but you would definitely look at that one. Okay. So here we're we're we're, we're we've got a we've got a, a, a water that has a moderate, uh moderately complex background matrix with with PFAS in it. All right. Um, but not heavily contaminated. Okay, but but a moderate, uh moderate background PFAS. Um, and we're showing the adsorption isotherm of the activated carbon versus the bentonite material. Okay. And you can see here that the activated carbon is significantly, would be ex expected to significantly outperform the bentonite material in this case. All right. And the cost of these, the carbon's somewhere hovering around two bucks a pound. Okay. Give or take. 
And the bat knife material costs a little bit more than that. Not significantly more, but more. Um, and so for, in this case, you can see that here, the carbon's outperforming the bat knife material. Okay, so now I got another one where this is a, this, this, this uh, uh, matrix that we're looking at here is the engineered bentonite down here, and this is the carbon. Uh, this is a more complex background matrix of contaminants with other PFAS compounds, other lower molecular weight PFAS compounds included, okay, along with the target compound here. And you see that the carbon is still outperforming, but the bentonite material in this case has upped its game fairly significantly. And that could be because it's more efficient now on the sorption of the uh, of the of the other constituents that are that are in the that are in the water, and 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 basically, you know, what it shows is that this the performance of this compound. There could be situations where this compound definitely outperforms activated carbon. We just didn't hit on it here, okay? But I, but I'm showing you just by changing the matrix, the the absorbability on and the efficiency of absorption on this bentonite material did increase fairly significantly okay so point being that this is a good material this engineered bentonite product but it's it's not you know so if someone comes at you and says oh this works this is going to work better than any carbon any other absorbent material which i've seen claims like that that's not true it's dependent on the on the case okay I'm going to jump now and show you some results for activated carbons compared against each other. Okay. So, this F400 carbon is a coal based activated carbon. It's made out of coal. Okay. It's made out of pyrolyzed coal, basically, to significantly increase its surface area. There's another, and uh, what we're showing, what we're looking at here is another coal based carbon. I think it's an Avoqua carbon made by Evoqua, it's a good product. And then there's also a coconut-based carbon here that, that we, we took a look at because the vendor was claiming that it's great for PFAS, okay? So in this case, all right, we got a C3 PFAS compound, C3 PFAS compound. That means that's jargon for, it's got three carbons in it, okay? It's a three, it's a perfluorinated compound, uh, it might be a branched, uh, it, it, it's it's a branched ether C3 compound, right? And it's difficult, it, it can be, it's known to be difficult to treat, difficult to sorb because it's low molecular weight. And it's got that thing going on where it's very polar because it's got that carboxylic acid functional group sticking on it. And it's it's just a small molecule. So you wouldn't expect it to sorb too well and it, it's challenging, all right? So we compared, here, now we ran three isotherms, one with the F400, one with the other coal-based carbon, and one with this coconut-based carbon, which is claimed to be you know, great for PFAS compounds. These are the two coal-based carbons run in pretty much parallel right here, up here, up top. So they're basically both outperforming the, co the, the coconut-based carbon in this case. Okay, now, Okay, now th this is, I believe this is the same wastewater matrix at this time, or the same uh, groundwater matrix. In this case, though, we're looking at a C4 compound that's also included, all right? A C4 PFAS compound, all right? This is the coconut-based carbon up here. And here's your two coal-based carbons. I'll let you look at that. Okay, so... This 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 coconut based carbon in this case is is gangbusters. Okay, this is incredibly good performance compared to these other two. It's the same water. You're just looking at a different compound now. You're looking at a C4 compound instead of the C3 compound. So what you should be getting out of this is there's no there's no single answer to how to most cost effectively treat these things, okay, or, and what sorbent you're going with. So if I was looking at, and this was actually a storm water, so a low, you know, a low background concentration storm water that had these compounds in it. And we had we we had to go after both of those compounds. Okay. And we had this data. We also ran a pilot, we also ran a pilot column, but just from looking at that isotherm data, 
we can estimate, and you can linearize the isotherm data with a like a, a Freundlich linearization, and you can you can use that equation, the linearized equation, to estimate carbon utilization. All right, and for this, for the for those two traces that I just showed you, we ran out the numbers on what it would take if I was treating 100 GPM, 100 gallons per minute of that water using those traces to make a decision on which carbon I would, which sorbent material, in this case, we're talking about carbon, we would recommend going forward with maybe in a pilot study or putting in full scale. And in this case, it was both of those things, okay? So you can look at the, the F400 carbon and you can see this is the annual burn rate that you would burn in that carbon to treat this compound and to treat that compound. OK, and we go to the coconut based, you, you see for the, the C4 compound, this this sorbent really would utilize the least amount. OK, compare of, of the of compared to the other two. That's the one where it was performing gangbusters. But the problem is to treat the other compound, you'd utilize a whole bunch of this stuff. And so we ended up in this case this these two all these two coal based carbons were pretty close to one another but the F400 won out here because of the better performance on the C4 compound we ended up recommending the F400 okay point being that even between activated carbon sorption you know activated carbon choices there is an optimum one that is going to allow you to treat the water to very, very low levels, non-detect levels, okay, um, and do it in the in a more cost-effective way than just selecting something that maybe someone's recommending to you and not doing this type of work, okay? Now, I'm going to talk to you about ion exchange resin, which is another way that you can, you can treat these compounds, okay? Because, like I had mentioned early on, they are ionic normally at, at uh, pHs that we find in the environment. They are anionic, negatively charged. But this is these ion exchange resins, and I'm just showing a few of them here. These are extremely specialized ion exchange resins. These are not the resins that you would use like out west to treat nitrate in groundwater or if you were trying to go after sulfate. OK, in those cases, you're using a, a conventional anion exchange resin and your concentration that you're treating is in the milligram per liter range. If you're going after sulfate, you'd be uh, in drinking water. It's it's five to ten milligrams per liter. It is those those anions are present in the water that you're treating. They're present in all surface water. They're present in in uh, groundwater at significantly higher concentrations than these than these PFAS compounds that we're going after. They are orders and orders of magnitude greater concentration. You would expect that there would be, if, if it's a straight ion exchange process, you would expect that these compounds would not be able to compete with the sorption of those compounds or with the ion exchange, of, with the exchange of those compounds. So these resins that, are, that have been developed, okay, are very specialized. They're, the ionic form is typically either a, chlor a chloride, or or a or a hydroxyl. Okay, that's that's the form that the compound, that functional group, that carboxylic acid functional group would come in and exchange with, knock the chlorine off, you know, and then it would be trapped on the resin. If it was a conventional ion exchange, uh, kind of a of a, of an activity, these are stuck on functional groups. Typically, it's a quaternary amine or some type of amine functional group on the resin. Okay, the thing is, it. It's not just ion exchange that's happening with these. There's sorption happening also, and it's kind of like not completely well known what exactly is happening. These polystyrenes cross-link with with divinyl benzene, blah blah blah. There's sorption going on in here along with ion exchange. Okay. The other thing about these is I'm talking to you about ones that are non-regenerable. There's some that are theoretically regenerable. And there's a couple products out there where they're looking at in situ regeneration, but right now it's not at the level where it can be just specified out of hand, where you're where you're not concerned about having issues with it. I'll kind of leave it at that. Okay, so so I'm talking to you about 
if we if we're using ion exchange resin kind of in place of activated carbon as absorption media slash ion exchange media, where once it's spent, it's got to go and get regenerated off site or be disposed of. OK, so let's look at. I got a C6 compound. I got F400 carbon and I got. One of these specialized ion exchange resins, OK? This is a, a groundwater that's fairly stiff contamination with PFAS, OK? And I'm looking at, I'm targeting the C6 compound here, OK? And I'm looking at the isotherms again. And we, we run these ion exchange resins through isotherms just like we do carbon. It's a little unconventional, but we get good results. So it's the same thing I showed you with the bottles to get the equilibrium, okay? And you can get the same kind of trace. So you can do this quickly and get a quick look to just see, hey, how are the two going to perform against each other? So on the C6 compound, you can see this is the carbon up here, and this is the ion exchange resin. So in this case, the activated carbon is outperforming the ion exchange resin. In a lot of places, it's twice as efficient in sorption, okay? All right, same water now, and I'm looking at the C3 compound. And if you go, if you remember what I said on the earlier slide where I said, hey, this lower molecular weight C3 compound that's got this functional group on it, that looks like that might be better for ion exchange because it's more polar. Well, that's kind of what we're seeing right here. Now the ion exchange resin outperforms the activated carbon. And this compound, if I if I'm depending on its influent concentration, if I'm treating water that has this compound and the C6 compound in it, this one's probably going to dictate how much media I go through because it's 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 efficiency of sorption is going to be a lot less than probably the C6 compound. All right. So in this case, from the looks of this, the ion exchange resin might be the choice. Okay. Then we get to this. So if I if I'm using that ion exchange resin, um, the thing about it is they're specialty resins. So the carbon, as I mentioned before, kind of floats in this range for cost. All right, buck seventy five would be like a regenerated carbon. You're you're really in the two to two twenty five range these days for carbon, and it's becoming more scarce. But that that F four hundred carbon's kind of up in here. The ion exchange resins, this is the price that you're looking at on a per pound. This is per pound, okay, on a per pound basis. These are highly engineered products. They're really good. They're, you know, they do they do what they do, but they're fairly expensive, okay? So in order for me to justify going with that resin, you know, in some instances, like this is twice as good on this trace. It needs to be like four times as good. OK, because. It's in some cases four times as expensive or more if I'm sending it off site. OK. The other thing to think about when you're picking a sorbent medium is what happens to that sorbent medium after I'm done with it. OK. For. If you have a reputable granular activated carbon dealer, and I'm talking about when you're using a lot of this stuff, you got beds that have 10 or 20,000 pounds of this stuff in it. Okay. If you have a reputable dealer, when you buy the carbon, you actually are paying for them to come and pick it up when it's done and, and you get the new stuff. All right. And somebody like a Calgon right now, they'll take that carbon away and they regenerate that carbon and then they put it in their regenerated carbon pool. It gets reused. OK. And and it's there's a sustainability angle there. OK, so they will give you a certification right now, even before you bring them anything that they get four or five nines plus level of destruction in their in their reactivation process, which is basically like a controlled incineration. It's a pyrolysis process. It's a thermal treatment process. So you can have that and, and they take ownership of it. So You've got that, you know, that's part of making the choice of going here. With the ion exchange resin, you just have to query 
and think about what's going to happen with that spent ion exchange resin and just make sure that it ends up in an appropriate place or it's being regenerated off site. Maybe somebody figures out how to do that. You just don't want it to end up in a landfill. So it's another point of, of decision when you're deciding which media to go with. Okay, I think I probably just said everything right here. All right, that's enough isotherm talk. All right, we're gonna go to 105. Okay, we're gonna go to some information on column studies. So usually we do the isotherms up front and then it might go to a column study. The column study is nothing more than a pilot study. Okay, and we usually run two, maybe bigger two inch diameter columns that have the media in it. This could be ion exchange resin, it could be activated carbon. We pretreat the water if it's got iron, and then we send it right through. And we run it at a uh, one of the main design asp, uh, design considerations of designing absorption column is your hydraulic loading rate. You want to be somewhere in the five gallon per minute per square foot range, uh, and you want to have an adequate empty bed contact time, which is kind of your residence time in the column. Uh, this is this information is directly scalable to a full scale system. You can go from a two inch column to a to a 10 foot diameter column, okay? And, and as long as you maintain, you know, the, these appropriate scale up conditions, okay? So, so we'll run these pilot studies using this type of apparatus. This is Dr. Ted Schoenberg on this one. He runs our treatability lab, but we're, out, we're obviously out in the field here on this one. So this is a, so what I'm showing you here is actually this setup, we're looking at, well, the, the contaminated water comes in and we've got multiple columns in series, but what we're showing here is a trace from the effluent from this column and a trace from the effluent of the second column, which follows the first column. This green line on top represents the influent concentration. This is real water that's contaminated, okay? All right, this is a, this is a C3 compound, okay? And it's, you know, we're in, we're in the 100, 100 microgram per liter range here. What you're seeing here is the effluent from the first column. That's the blue, the blue dots. This is referred to as a breakthrough curve where you see it. You've got no, no, no detection, no detection. This is volume on the, on the x-axis, volume treated. All of a sudden it starts to break through, okay? We're letting this thing, and this is what we want to see when we do a pilot column, is we want to see complete breakthrough in one of the columns, okay? And that's what's happening here. This is, this is when it gets up to the influent concentration, it's completely broken through. And I just want to let you know that this, the, the open dots are the effluent concentration from the second column in series. I can tell you that right here, even though you can't see it because of the scale, there is a detect right here when this thing completely breaks through, we actually got a detect in the effluent from the second column. Because as this breaks through, all this becomes the influent to the second column, all right? Uh, if I integrated the area be between the, uh, the influent line and the effluent line from the first column, it represents the mass of contaminant that's on the column, okay? Uh, okay, so, so what do, what do we what do we do with this information? The first thing we do is we look at the shape of this wavefront, and this is a, this is a nice wavefront. It gives you an idea of once it starts to break through, how long it's going to take to get to really high concentrations coming through that first column. Because if I'm running two columns in series, like in a treatment train, I have to make some decisions about when to change my my media out. You know, so this is this is really valuable information when you when you're able to run a test like this okay so let me show you something now about how you might look at this data all right okay so there's in the world of activated carbon treatment and or ion exchange but mainly this is really activated carbon now you typically will have two columns in series and the way you run them is you run the first column You'll start to detect breakthrough at some level. Usually any substantial amount of your contaminant that starts to come out of that first column, if you got two columns in series, you call for a change. You change 
the the media in the first column, and then you basically make that the lag column. You reverse the flow. This one's been preloaded to some extent because you've, you've, you've let this come into it, okay? And then you change it. That's how you run activated carbon systems everywhere, okay, generally, okay? Now, these compounds, when you're treating these compounds, you know, I'm showing you that they sorb. I can tell you, they don't sorb that great. It's not like we're treating PCBs or something that sticks like glue in the old days, you know, on the carbon with really high loadings. This stuff doesn't, and you get into these, some of these compounds, this, this C3 compound doesn't sorb that great. You're going to burn through a lot of carbon if you just treat it that way, okay? Another way you could think about this, if I have really a water that has some contamination like this one does, or even if I'm in this range or even this range, you know, 10 micrograms per liter, treating to non-detect, you might consider a system like this, okay, with three columns in series. It's a little bit more capital. This is what we've done on a few plants that are in operation right now, okay? What does that get me? Well, if I look at this trace here, all right? And like I said, if I had two col columns in series, I'd probably change the carbon out as soon as I saw any appreciable amount. Remember, I'm being regulated. This is coming in in the, in the microgram per liter range. I'm being regulated to the single nanogram per liter range, which is basically nothing, okay? So you can't really mess around. You, 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 you have to be very conservative in your operation. So if I'm running three cans in series, though, I'm going to be, and I have this information, I'm going to be, a little, I'm going to be much more bold in my decision as to when I change this carbon, this first can out. As a matter of fact, the goal on a couple of systems that we currently operate is to get to 100% breakthrough, get to complete breakthrough in that first column. If I'm able to do that, if you look at, remember I said the mass sorbed is the mass under the, you know, under the influent line minus the effluent line from the column. If I change it out here, this, this area here is the amount that I've sorbed. If I change it out here, this whole area is the amount of contaminant that I've sorbed on that carbon. And the blue area is the additional amount that I am able to sorb by having this configuration versus this configuration. If I send it off here, I'm basically throwing away available sorption capacity. It's not sustainable. I have to truck this stuff off. It gets, you know, they they use a thermal process to regenerate it. It's 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 not, you know, it, it's a it's if we can if you can do this and justify the cost of this, this is a much more sustainable way to run this type of an operation. You're going to get much more efficient use out of that activated carbon. Okay, that's the point here. All right. Now We've run the running the numbers on this. Let's say I got a system. I just just a number of 650 gallons per minute. The difference between running a system like this and changing the carbon out here at this point, and running it like this and changing the carbon out somewhere, you know, allowing this to break through at some level, okay, is was estimated to be about 180 thousand bucks a year in in carbon costs. All right. That's for this compound, which is a three C3 compound. Same water, okay? Same study. There's another compound in here, which is a C4 compound that actually breaks through almost at the exact same time that, that this compound does. And I'm just showing you when we did a pilot study for that compound, what the estimated efficiency of sorption was onto that carbon. And it was 0 0.035 milligrams of the PFAS compound per gram of carbon. Okay, so I'm talking about now. I'm, I'm talking about when you go to full scale, and the full scale system that's been in operation now, okay, for a couple of years. We actually were able to achieve this level of sorption. Okay, and the biggest difference between the two, it was the empty bed contact time. Of the of the columns in the pilot system, it was we were looking at six minutes. In the full scale system, because of the way it was designed, it was it was closer to double that. And we think that that also improved the 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 uh, the efficiency of sorption in that case. And what does that mean? Okay, for for 
for the system that is currently online, the estimated annual savings of going to this configuration versus that configuration and the up the uh, increased efficiency associated with the higher empty bed contact time is an estimated savings of 300 grand per year on carbon costs for that system. So, you know, it means real money. The cost of this is paid for in a single year for sure, and then some. All right. So, doing this type of evaluation is extremely important and can really save you money. I want to go back to those previous slides that I showed you where there was no clear cut answer as to what sorbent is it works the best. Once you filter through that, and then if you're able to do that kind of a test, a breakthrough study, even if it's a very small scale, high rate study, you know, vendors will do it for you. You just have to be able to look at the data to know that they're giving you good information. You want to look at that, okay, to, to come in to, to inform your design, all right? Okay, now I'm going to jump to, this is the same uh, breakthrough. Uh, curve, same contaminant, same breakthrough curve. This red line is reactivated carbon. This is pooled reactivated carbon that you can just buy from like Calgon. All right. We don't know where it came from. It just, they they reactivated it. They regenerated it. It doesn't have any contaminants on it, but it was real interesting because most uh, carbon systems that we put on if we're treating VOCs or whatever, we usually just assume we're going to go with reactivated carbon because you can save at least 20 cents a pound on it. If you look here, you'll see that this, this is not the kind of uh, breakthrough curve you want to see when you're running a system. This, is, this, in, this broke through, not completely, but it broke through significantly almost immediately. So I just wanted to show you this. This is a piece of information. You know, don't just assume you can use reactivated carbon because it's going to save you money, especially if you're not. If we hadn't done this test, it would have shown in an isotherm, but if we hadn't done no, we hadn't done an isotherm, we hadn't done this test, and we just said, oh yeah, just put reactivated carbon. That's what we're using on, you know, the TCE site over, you know, it would have been a problem. You would have had violations. Okay, so I just wanted to get you that piece of information. I'm getting to the end. One seventeen. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about some general things now. All right. First thing: pretreatment challenges. Nuisance solids and iron, they have to go. If you have iron in your in your recover, it typically it shows up in groundwater, but I have a surface water stream that has 10 milligrams per liter of iron in it. Certainly if it's a couple milligrams per liter and more, you really need to consider removing the iron. If it's more than a couple, mil, uh, like a milligram per liter, you, you need to get rid of it. Because what's gonna happen is it's gonna, it's gonna oxidize. It comes out, of, if it's in the ground, it usually comes out as a plus two ferrous iron which is soluble, but then it's going to oxidize to plus three as soon as it is in contact with air, and then it's going to precipitate as ferric hydroxide. And it is going to coat your media, and you will be changing your media out, whether it's ion exchange resin or carbon, before it's reached its absorptive capacity because you're, you're getting back pressure issues. Even if you're able to backwash it, you're going to run into problems. So you need to get rid of it. How can you get rid of it? You just you can use standard oxidation, aeration, usually you add a coagulant, maybe a little bit of polymer. You can drop it out in a clarifier. This is an inclined plate clarifier that we have operating at a facility. Uh, another way, and this is uh, a facility where this is what it looks like when you have 30 milligrams per liter of iron in your in your water, and you this is a drying bed. This is what the cake looks like. That's iron, okay. And you don't want that in your columns, okay. Another way you can do it that we're doing at a couple sites is using um, membrane uh, process for uh, micro slash ultrafiltration. To you go through the same oxidation step, but then you run it through a membrane. Okay, and there's mobile membranes that you can bring out. They're very resilient. They're typically hollow fiber membranes, the same ones that you would use. And I've specified for a number of membrane bioreactor systems. They work really well. And then there's a reject stream from this that you send to solids treatment and you have to dewater the solids from that. So that's two solutions that are currently being used. These will also get rid of any suspended solids in your influent and it needs to be taken care of. Okay. All right. I'm just going to talk to you about some operational considerations that you need to think about. 
All right, one thing that you need to consider if you're treating, if you're going for it, like in this kind of a system and you're really going to push your first column and you got like real PFAS coming in and a reasonably high concentration, you're really going to have a lot of contaminant moving through this column, remember, and you're treating to like nothing, okay? So if you're running a system and you're running it that way, one of the things that we've been running into is the following. This is a standard carbon absorption column. There's carbon in it, it's downflow. Here's a schematic of it. It's got a support. This is a, a, a media support. So underneath here in this annular space, there's no activated carbon. And there's, there's septa that allow the treated water to pass through and then the treated water goes out here. We've been running a system, we had been running a system that um, where we're treating and, and trying to really have efficient use in the first column, like I said, you know, like with three cans in series. We found that when we change this carbon out and we've, when we change the carbon out and then this, this unit gets put in the lag position, we do a, we do a quality, we, we wash the things, you know, we, we really wash it, pressure wash it, et cetera. We were finding that, and then we do a, a quality rinse and check that for concentration because now this column becomes facing your effluent. This is a direct discharge system. This becomes your effluent to the system that you're regulated on to very low levels. You don't want any detects. We found that in some situations, we would actually replace the carbon, clean it, and then do a quality rinse and get a detect. And we were really scratching our heads on that one because no one had ever really seen that before. This includes carbon vendors that have been around and I've been around for a few years myself. So what we ended up doing here in this one was we went in and we wipe tested these annular spaces, the underside of this cone, this wall. You don't see anything, uh, but we were getting PFAS, okay? And when we extrapolated, there was definitely enough PFAS sticking here to cause a detect. And so I'm just mentioning this to you. It's the kind of thing that you have to be aware of if you're specking a carbon column. That doesn't mean you can't, this is a good design, doesn't mean you can't go this way. It's just that you need to incorporate some uh, pretty aggressive cleaning of this area also when you change that carbon out. This is a this is a, another reactor that does not have the kind of support membrane uh, plate in it, but it's got a uh, a lateral that you need to make sure you get every piece of carbon out of. If you're running a system with these three columns in series and you're really pushing the first one to get optimum treatment utilization of carbon, okay. So I'm just letting you know that that's something that we've encountered. All right. Other things to talk about, how are we doing on time, 122. Is there background organic? Okay, I don't really talk about this too much, but if there's high concentrations of organic in the water, just like chemical oxidation demand or TOC, you can expect that they're gonna compete with sorption for the PFAS compounds and you may need to pretreat them. That's, not, that's something that's gonna come up when wastewater sources start to get regulated for these compounds, especially municipalities and industry, you know, you may have to, you know, you may have to remove any COD heal before you can get to how am I going to treat my microgram per liter of PFAS down to one nanogram per liter. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that the other thing that you have to watch out for is when you're treating these waters and you have an influent concentration that's at steady state, like this, it comes in like this. Well, if I'm drink, if if it's a surface water source, and all of a sudden I have a big rainfall event, and the influent concentration here drops like down to half, you got to watch out because the way those adsorption isotherms work is they're reversible. It's called hysteresis. You can this stuff will desorb, and this stuff is really mobile. It'll desorb off this carbon just as fast as it sorbed onto it. And we've had instances where that, where you see that happen. And then all of a sudden your wave front propagates, it breaks out of your column, it, it goes into the next column and you're gonna end up wasting some carbon. So you have to watch out for that, okay? And 
this one right here. There is no single solution that will provide stable and consistent treatment at the lowest cost. Process optimization is required. I want to I just want to leave you with that. Okay, I don't think there's anything else I really need to mention here. I just gave you guys a lot of information. Hopefully you can use it and make some educated decisions when you're uh, faced with uh, managing these compounds. Anybody got any questions? All right, thank you, Les. Uh, that was a really important presentation on all the challenges, uh, but also how much we've learned about uh, PFAS uh, absorption technologies and the pros and cons. Um, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand uh, and we can call on you to answer, ask it live, or you can enter it into the chat. Looks like there's a few questions already uh, entered during the webinar. Uh, first one is, is it possible to use I'm not sure what this is referring to. It says, is it possible to use both to target each type of PFAS? Maybe both types of absorbents? Yeah, yeah. And and uh, one thing I didn't mention is sometimes it depends on the mix of the PFAS that are problematic. Um, and sometimes we we if you have one, if you have a PFAS, maybe it's a low molecular weight PFAS, and really, you know, the ion exchange resin, like the one graphic I showed you that showed the ion exchange resin working very efficiently on the one compound, but not so efficiently on the other. It was still more expensive than carbon. But you may decide, and we were very close to recommending this, we just didn't have the right mix. It's another case of there is no ultimate solution. But we were really considering treating the easy to sorb carbon, uh, you know, on carbon PFOS in the upfront part of the system, and then throwing an ion exchange bed on the back end and letting that mop up that one compound that sorbed so efficiently or exchanged so efficiently on ion exchange. So yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. And in some instances that may, I was very close to specifying that, but, but it just, the numbers just didn't work out, but it, it could have gone either way if, if the concentrations were, uh, relationship was a little different. Yeah, so yeah, it's a good point and it's true. Okay. Okay, next question is, what was the sorbent breakthrough for longer versus shorter chain PFAS? Uh, the the breakthrough on the longer chain, like I was showing you that one, uh, uh, that was a C, that was a C3 compound. The, the breakthrough on the longer chain compound, it didn't, we like we didn't see it breakthrough. You know what I mean? <laughs> in the time that we ran that, it wasn't, it wasn't, we didn't get the full breakthrough. We saw some breakthrough of it, but it didn't get the full breakthrough. So significantly longer with the, with the, e with the more easy to sorb, uh, longer, higher molecular weight compound. When we run these systems after a while, we're not even looking, and, the, and these might be like real sexy ones that you've heard about that are regulated. Like we don't even really worry about them kind of. We got other ones. There's ones that are breaking through early, and those are the ones that we target and look at. They're also regulated in, in the systems that we're running, but like we don't, we, we won't even look at the other ones. We, we, we get data on them, but we don't expect to see them showing up. We see the other ones showing up. They lead the change out, the requirement for change out. So. Okay, next we have a, a two part or maybe just two separate questions. Um, I have read some papers that have found strong positive correlations between anion exchange capacity of GAC and the ability of the GAC to remove PFAS. Have you found certain surface characteristics to be impactful for most efficient PFAS removal by GAC? Wow, I, I don't really, no, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the fact that GAC also functions, you know, with there's some ion exchange component with it. I guess I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. I can tell you that for some reason the F400 and specifically the Virgin F400 is is seems to outperform other carbons right now. But that that one of Oqua carbon, which I think is the 1230 coal based carbon, does also works pretty well. But I have no idea to what extent ion exchange is a component of that of that sorption. I hadn't really thought about it. it. I definitely agree that it could be happening, though. 
like I like I was mentioning on the ion those specialty ion exchange resins, there's definitely sorption going on with them along with ion exchange. It could you know work the other way with carbon too. So good point. Okay, uh, another question is when looking at short chain PFAS such as C3, is more efficient removal on ion exchange resin resin solely a result of a more polar head group or a combination of polarity and being outcompeted? on the GAC by longer chain, more hydrophobic compounds. That and there's some sorption going on on the ion exchange resin also. So, kind of answered his own question, you know, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, another one just came in, uh, to reduce hysteresis and moderate PFAS influent concentrations, have you specified equalization basins post iron treatment and pre GAC ion exchange? So ground, you know, when you're dealing with groundwater, usually you don't see that kind of fluctuation, luckily. Uh, but on the surface water side, uh, we do have the ability for um, uh, equalizing that water to some extent. And, and uh, we try to do that to the extent practicable. But sometimes you can't. When you get hit with a heavy rainstorm, you don't have the volume to actually give you concentrated concentration equalization. Um, it hasn't been a huge problem, but it can definitely, it's something to look out for, which is what I was trying to emphasize, um, that you will get desorption if you, if, if you, uh, if you have a significant decrease in concentration. And the other thing that we found is if you have two trains in parallel and you're running them both, uh, you may want to, you know, and flows decrease or something. You might think, hey, maybe I'm just going to run the one train and let the other one sit bottled up. You don't want to do that because in the one that sits, if you let it sit for a week or two, um, the stuff in the in the, the lead column will just desorb. And, it, and then when you turn that column on, you'll have all sorts of breakthrough going on and you'll waste a bunch of carbon, which is another thing we've, and that's because of the hysteresis effect of these compounds specifically. So something else I forgot to mention to you is school of hard knocks information. So if you had to do that, probably what you'd want to do is drain the column out, which has its own problems, but it's going to be better than um, uh, spreading the wavefront through the first column and then having to, um, change carbon out more frequently until you get all that carbon out of your system or ion exchange rather. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, we got one more right now. Um, so ion exchange is four times as expensive, but in many times only twice as effective compared to GAC. However, the additional CapEx spend, uh, does the additional CapEx spend not offset o and costs in the long run? And how does Bed volumes play a role in overall cost. Okay. Um, so for ion exchange, if you're looking at a non-regenerable ion exchange resin, you're basically going to put it in the same thing that looks like a carbon bed. If you have regenerable ion exchange, you can put that in a thin bed because, but making sure that like a smaller, like you're using a smaller volume of ion exchange resin, but you have to make sure that the wave front, the shape of that wave front is very square. In other words, you're getting great treatment, you're getting great treatment, you're getting great treatment, and then all of a sudden it just breaks through. Then you can have a then you can have a like a, a bed that's not that deep. And you can use less ion exchange resin if you're going to regenerate it in situ. Um, if you're not regenerating in situ, you're just going to want to have as much ion exchange resin as you can get in there so you can run the thing for longer and then change it out. Now your question, uh, repeat the, the second part of the, the detail how, of the question. How does bed volumes play a role in overall cost? The more, the more bed volume, the more empty bed contact time that you are designing for, the bigger your reactor gets, which means the more cost of the reactor and the more cost of the media that you put in the reactor. But basically, when you start talking about higher flows, anything over, say, 500 GPM, you start getting into like a 10 or 12 foot diameter column and they can build those. They typically come with 20,000 pounds, the whole 20,000 pounds of media, and they can build them with twice the sidewall so you can get 40 in. But that's all you can do. Then you start stacking them 
in parallel. You start stacking trains in parallel to get more flow. There's also municipalities like converting their their old filtration, their old sand filter downflow sand filter beds, uh, and just putting carbon in them. To you know, when they have to polish off low concentrations of PFAS to even lower concentrations, they're they're doing that too. But for pressurized systems that like you might put on uh, 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 impacted surface waters, impacted smaller volume surface waters and groundwaters, you're going to use you know the columns that are available commercially. Okay, next question is, uh, would pretreatment of the water, depending on what is present, for example, TOC, uh, would that help enhance sorption media capacity overall as a cheaper way to enhance PFAS removal? Yes, if you can prove that the that if you have a heel of organic uh, in the water, first thing you want to show is that that is actually sorbable, number one. And then num and you can do that with some quick tests. Is it sorbable, number one? Number two, is it actually going to compete for the PFAS in any meaningful way. And you can do that with some of the preliminary kind of isotherm jar stuff I, I kind of showed you to figure that out. If you have a large heel, like if you're talking about wastewater where you've got hundreds of milligrams per liter of organic, you're really gonna wanna look to see is it sorbable number one and is it gonna compete with the PFAS and it likely is going to, and it's likely gonna require some kind of pretreatment, which is beyond any of the pretreatment stuff I showed you, you're probably looking at either sorbing it or biologically treating it or something, you know, so. Or okay. you're gonna just, yep, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Les, I didn't realize you were John. Go ahead. No, you're good, you're good. What's next? Uh, so I think this will be our last question for today is, are there any real-time concentration monitoring indicators of PFAS concentrations to help with adjusting operations of these treatment systems? No, we spend a lot of money monitoring. We we try to get quick turnaround on target compounds from labs that might not be using the approved, you know, like they're not using the super duper approved like uh, uh, method, 537 method, because when you get your permit, they'll have a, sp uh, a lab that's specifically approved to do that. But there are other labs that have and in, in, in industry that have developed techniques for monitoring these compounds, and we try to get quick turnaround on that, and that's how we do it. Um, I'm really hoping that we can get to a, a TOF, like a total organic fluorine analysis that's accurate. The precursor analysis is okay, but that, you know, that's still developmental. Uh, but the, the, the total organic fluorine analysis would be great, but I know there's some problems with it right now. And I think that that's probably where regulatory framework's gonna go because there's just so many of these compounds. You really need a gross indicator of what the compounds are and be regulated on that, kind of like COD or BOD. Um, that's probably coming at some point in the future. Right now it's compound specific. And yes, um, if, if we had that, we would use it, but we don't. So we rely on, um, sending samples out and getting data. I, I also didn't mention on that, the carbon column that I showed, there was in-depth in de bed depth sampling ports, and we definitely use those also. We sample within the bed depth to see where that wave front is. And if you had two carbon columns in series, you would definitely be doing that in your first column to understand where your wave front is, okay? So. Okay, I think with that, we will wrap it up. If you can go to the next slide, Les. So our next webinar will be on June 14th, at the same time, 12.30 p.m. Eastern. It will be presented by Mahir Chokshi on leveraging sustainability, a framework to an improved remediation process. Uh, the link to the PDH credit form has been posted in the chat. If you had any issue accessing that or didn't receive the link and you want to get a PDH credit, just uh, send us an email. And we'll help you uh, get that information. We hope to see you next month. And thank you to everybody who joined us today for today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time.